uh, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today. Uh, professor Paul Gilbert uh, is um, Professor of uh, Clinical Psychology at the University of Derby and Honorary Visiting Professor at the University of Queensland. He has uh, authored and, and edited 23 books and over 330 papers and book chapters. In 2006, he established the Compassionate Mind Foundation as an international charity with the mission statement to promote well-being through the scientific understanding and application of compassion. He is uh, one of the most important proponents and advocates of compassion focused therapy internationally and um, um, importantly for uh, the purpose of this webinar uh, compassion focused therapy is uh, based on evolutionary science and also a recently published meta-analysis uh, of studies from over 17 countries have shown that compassion focused therapy is a highly effective intervention Paul's title today is The Evolution of Compassion, Its Facilitators and Inhibitors. So we're delighted, Paul, to have you, and uh, over to you. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much, Riyad, because, you know, we, you and I, we go back a long way back to Norwich days, <laughs> and also all the amazing work you do for promoting evolutionary understanding of mental states and mental health difficulties that you've done over many years and your, your fantastic book and what you've done for the Royal College and so forth. So delight to be here uh, for you and uh, to, to talk about uh, the evolution of compassion because compassion can have quite a um, tricky con um, connotations. You know, people think it's about being nice and being kind and that sort of things. Um, of course, it can involve that, but uh, it's also a lot different from that. So let's just begin then. I'm going to take you through some of the history of how we got to uh, thinking about compassion as a basic evolved motivational system with physiological infrastructures. And those physiological infrastructures can have very powerful effects on mental states and in particular, um, threat-based states. So we'll, we'll get to that as we go through. So this is the book. Most of the stuff I'm going to be talking on uh, tonight, tonight is here. And I think the... For us, the crucial route is to uh, put our uh, understanding the mental health and antisocial problems and their psychosocial therapies in the basic sciences rather than more narrow psychotherapeutic models. You know, we know that we have hundreds of different schools of psychotherapy. And one of the reasons that we have so many schools is because we haven't agreed on the basic underlying science. Whereas I think in medicine, people basically agree on what you know, the physiological mechanisms of the body are, but we haven't really done that in, in psychotherapy. And this requires the study of complex interactions and individual variation, so uh, between, into, between people within populations. And it's also the importance of developing specific focused and guided in, in, in interventions for specific problems and specific people. You know, people, uh, depression has many variations of presentation and response, doesn't it really? Um, so the thing about an evolutionary approach is that, you know, bodies with minds evolved to survive and reproduce. That's pretty obvious. Everybody knows that. Uh, these life tasks, actually, the the challenges of, of survival and repro uh, reproduction are central to the organization of four functions of mind. And I'm going to be talking about the four functions of mind as we go through the talk. And these four functions are basically motives, what motivates us, the emotions that are stimulated in our journey through life as we try to achieve things or get blocked by different things, the ways in which we think and reason and process information and the regulators of our behavior, those are basically, and if you read any undergraduate textbook, you're gonna find chapters on each of these. There are other ways you can think about the functions of mind. Some people want to have imagery or whatever, um, but uh, this will do for, for the time being. So the question is, how do you translate evolutionary insights into ways of understanding mental health difficulties and developing psychotherapeutic interventions? That's always the big issue. Okay, so we've got these evolutionary insights, but 
how do you actually translate these into actually psychotherapeutic interventions? Well, that's been something I've been interested in for a long time. So uh, just to give you a little bit of the background story, um, I did my PhD in the 70s in the, mental health, in the Medical Research Council unit in Edinburgh, and we took people who were depressed from all over the uh, Scotland and part of the north of uh, England. Um, so I had an opportunity to, and I had an um, office on the ward, so I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with some quite depressed people. And Edinburgh, they were doing a lot of work on the serotonin hypothesis of depression and and uh, and the receptors and receptor 5 and receptor 10 and all these different receptors. Um, but I was very interested in the physiological changes that could be generated because of psychosocial, psychosocial processes. So the idea that you can generate depressed states, not because of an underlying disease process, but because of how the individual is interacting with their environment, that was my interest. And so my first book was called From Psychology to Brain State. And if you want to know what I am, I'm basically a brain state theorist, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So um, the this book was really focused on that, and that really has been part and parcel of my life. And that's one of the reasons I'm very interested in motivational processes like compassion, because compassion has now, we now know compassion has a whole range of identifying identifiable physiological systems. And if you can develop therapies that will target those systems in the frontal cortex and the vagus or wherever, uh, then you can produce quite uh, major processes of change. And I think a lot of therapies now are beginning to recognize that we do need therapies that are physiologically powerful. Uh, if you can, if you only change people's thoughts or whatever, and you're not changing physiological systems, then you have higher rates of relapse rate. Then in 89, I was very interested in the role of motivation because I'd done training in cognitive therapy with Tim Beck and, and, and others. We, uh, Ivy Blackburn, who was my supervisor in Edinburgh, had actually done the first trial in CBT. So I was very, very fortunate as a young person to be uh, subjected to the early cognitive therapy. And, and uh, cognitive therapy is great. I love cognitive therapy. But one of the things that I was concerned about as a person interested in brain state theory and evolutionary processes was motivation. And in the um, late 70s and early 80s, there was quite a lot within evolutionary theory looking at um, basic motivations. And um, what uh, these were, sorry, these were related to things such as caregiving and care seeking. Attachment theory, for example, was really beginning to move ahead from the early 60s when uh, Bowlby and co and Harry Harlow and all of that uh, had started their work. Um, then there was quite a lot of work on cooperating. Um, people like John Price in 1972 talked a lot about um, competitive behavior, hierarchical behavior, and how that relates to issues of um, defeat and uh, depression and social anxiety. And there was also uh, studies on sexuality. So these were regarded as basic motivational systems. And what I was interested in is, is the degree to which people were able to pursue these motivations safely, helpfully, and competently. So can you care for others competently and safely? Are you able to elicit care helpfully, safely, and competently? Are you able to turn to people when you need to? Can you? Are you a cooperator? Can you be part of a group? Do you know how to belong? Are you able to compete safely? Are you able to be assertive? Or these challenges, these social challenges, do you do them unsafely, unhealthily, and incompetently? So if you're competitive, are you just aggressive? Um, are you more psychopathic? Uh, if you're caring, are you empathically caring, or do you impose your care? Uh, if you're a care seeker, are you dependent? Do you become dependent? Are you compulsively self-reliant? So there's a whole ways in which you can think about some of the challenges of social motivational processing um, gives rise to individuals who can have trouble in them. And this is important because when you understand some of these processes in terms of motivation system, we can see that, for example, we can distinguish guilt and shame because guilt evolved from a caring system. It's the avoidance of causing harm. Quite a lot of research on that now. And although guilt and shame are often thought about interchangeably, they are actually very different. They're different in terms of the phenomenology, in terms of their physiology. Shame, on the other hand, is very much linked to the competitive system 
the, the issue of being inferior, rejectable, deficient, flawed, being looked down on, all of that sort of stuff. Whereas guilt is not really about being looked down on and being inferior. Guilt is all about um, having violated caring, uh, motivation, caring, and being harmful. So those are just as small examples of how by using the uh, evolutionary motivational systems, you can see that you get these different ways of understanding these psychological processes, and therefore, how you're going to um, how you're going to intervene. Because if you've only got a say cognitive model, cognitive model won't help you see that underneath there are these fundamental motivational differences. Um, another paper that was very influential to me was uh, Dupuy and Montgro Struporinsky's paper on affiliated bonding, and they highlighted that social motivational systems could be broken into two basic ones. One is called affiliation, which is the dimension linked to closeness, social closeness, warmth, affectional bonding, and that's linked to things like oxytocin, endorphins, and so on. Uh, but the other motivational system, which we would call um, competitive, links to the more competitive achievement orientation. And uh, they highlight the fact that this one in particular that has become extremely important to humans uh, during hunter-gatherer period of uh, evolution. And I'll have a look at that in a, in a moment. What we also know is that humans have evolved many basic social needs, particularly social needs for relating, social needs for being cared for, social needs for um, being stimulated within relationships. You know, the way in which parents talk to their children, the way they look at their children, the facial expressions, the sharing sharing of emotion, all of these things are extremely important for the, the maturation of the child and the, the infant and then the child's brain. And so we're biologically orientated for these uh, relationships which are basically compassionate in the sense that they are able to be empathic to us and they understand our needs and they step in if we are struggling or suffering. And we'll have a look at that as we go through then I was, a lot of my research, as uh, Riyad knows, because we did some of this together many years ago, I was very interested in the the social rank system, and in particular, the way in which, uh, taking on from some of John Price's work and Leon Sloman and others, um, the way depression in particular was linked to this perception of being low rank, uh, feeling inferior and shame prone, being self-critical. And uh, some years ago, we did a study here, we asked, depressed people, you know, do you feel inferior? Do you feel a failure in life? Do you feel defeated by life? And they said, yes, 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 high scores. But if you ask them about the caring motivation, uh, do you feel you're dishonest? Do you feel you're caring? Do you feel you're not, you're not caring? You're, um, they'd say no. So when it comes to judging themselves as caring individuals, depressed people say, no, I try and be honest. I try and be helpful. I might not be able to because I'm depressed, but I try to be. So it's quite important then that we could see that uh, uh, depression is being carried in this competitive system, the sense of being a failure, not being able to control one's life, not being able to be assertive, the silencing of the self, all of these things. And we also know that motivational systems uh, have a fundamental role in organizing uh, a lot of the functions of the mind. So if you're off to see your lover tonight, that will affect what you're paying attention to, how you're thinking, what you're planning to do, go out for a nice meal or whatever. If, on the other hand, you are suffering from a, some illness and you're going to see your GP or you need to talk to a friend because you're struggling or whatever, then your brain will be organized in a very different way. And, of course, if you are the the doctor or the, or the friend that's offering the help, your brain will be organized in a different way. Now, of course, motives aren't the only things that organize your mind, basic beliefs do as well, and so on. But generally speaking, motives have fundamental organizing um, properties on the mind. Now, in terms of compassion, we can see compassion as a basic motive. And all motives, as you probably know, are rooted in algorithms. They're called SR algorithms. That simply means if A, do B. So, and we'll look at this a little later. If an animal perceives a threat, like a predator appears, then the amygdala is triggered and they become roused and they run away or whatever. If, on the other hand, they see something that's worthy of food eating, the hypothalamus is triggered, different physiological system, and 
If they see a sexual opportunity, then again, different physiological system is triggered with a different response. So if A, then do B, this is how motives work. Um, and this is certainly true for compassion. Uh, and the, the A, the stimulus for compassion is some signal that indicates suffering and distress uh, and needs that activates the desire to move towards that uh, suffering and then the B is the action. So compassion can be defined in these ways as a sensitivity to suffering, distress of self and others with a, a commitment to try to alleviate and prevent it. That's the basic definition and we can see that it fans out in terms of this basic algorithm and each really require courage and wisdom because courage without wisdom can be reckless if I see somebody fall into a fast flowing river and I think I must save them, so I jump in, but I can't swim. Well, that might be courageous, but it's not terribly wise. Um, equally, if I have wisdom, I know how to swim. I know how to save somebody, but I'm just too anxious. I'm very anxious about so uh, then I don't take, I don't act on my, my knowledge and um, without commitment and uh, nothing may happen. So we know that people can be sensitive to suffering and they may know what to do, but they're not very committed to do anything about it. And that one of the problems is uh, with health psychology is we often know what would be good for us in terms of losing weight, getting fit, eating a healthy diet. So it's not that we don't know. And it's not honestly that we're not motivated. We would like to get fit, but we're not committed enough to follow through on behaviors. And that's important because... This commitment, what is it that creates commitment to a behavior change? That can sometimes be where problems really arise. Not so much in understanding, not even in terms of motivation. It's actually being able to commit to action, which is the key thing. And we'll have a look at that a little later. Now, I did mention earlier about how we contextualize the mind has a major, major impact on how we think about our, our um, interventions. And um, there are lots of ways in which we can do this. So here's one way in which we contextualize the mind. We can see these two different um, evolutionary paths for survival, which is feeding and defending oneself, shelter. But then you have the reproduction ones where you have to have parental investment and so on, which is, it, this one requires you to have uh, um, processing systems that process interactions, basically. And you can you can break them up as well, actually. So you could break up these two. So the the ways in which you process competitive behavior um, and uh, engaging in dominant subordinate behaviors is obviously very different from the psychological uh, mechanisms you need in order to form um, pro-social relationships, caring relationships, attachment relationships. They're, they're both interpersonal and they both require reciprocal dynamic interactional sequences, but they're obviously are quite different processing systems. Um, so evolutionary stable strategies really are partly what drives our basic motives. And evolutionary strategies are ways of solving challenges to survival and reproduction. They tend to be species common. Uh, and here are some ones that are examples. Um, K versus um, selection um, for breeding. Now, uh, this means that some species have hundreds of eggs, but they like turtles or whatever. But once they've laid their eggs, they have no more interest in their offspring. And most of those offspring will die before they get to reproductive age. So it's a very wasteful thing. But in more stable environments, there's more case selection where actually have fewer offspring, but you start to invest in them. Okay, food choice on a bird versus carnivore. So I'm not going to go into this too much but just to give you an example of these are strategies and those strategies are going to have massive impact on the motivational system so for example if you're a carnivore then you have to be able to identify prey you need to be able to hunt you need to be able to kill blah 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 but you don't need to do any of that if you're an omnivore if you're just eating the leaves you don't need to do any of that so these strategies really do have a massive impact on the kind of motivational systems and the physiological processes that go with it that you're going to evolve. So strategies have 
three basic life tasks. I mean, there are there the 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 survival and reproduction gives rise to three basic life tasks. The first life task is that all living things need to have ways they can identify threats and protect themselves. Secondly, they need to have ways in which they can identify resources that are important to them uh, to maintain and sustain their survival, and they have to be able to get hold of them uh, to eat food and so on and so on. And also. Uh, there needs to be periods of resting and digesting, even true for most, not all, but most plants go through cycles of resting and digesting, or at least regeneration, you know, shedding the leaves and so on and so on. And for um, mammals and for humans, um, these processes, the mechanisms that facilitate your ability to identify threat and generate motivated behavior to protect yourself, the ability to identify resources and opportunities and rewards uh, and the ability to identify opportunities for resting and divest and, and digesting. These can be conscious, but they can also be non-conscious. And of course, you get conflicts. For example, what happens if your rewards is food, but the food is in a high predator territory? So you've got to balance your risk of becoming lunch in your pursuit of lunch. And there's, the brain is made up of a whole range of these uh, uh, processes which can sometimes be in conflicts. And of course, that was conflict was the basis of the Freudian psychodynamics. But we now know that we can identify basic evolved systems which can create these conflicts, particularly the issue of resource seeking versus protection. That's a very big one. Uh, we, we causes a lot of approach avoidance conflict in many, many uh, of our clients. So here are the, the big four again. These are the big four functions, which we'll come and have a look at. Um, so let's look at this in a slightly different way now. So here's our life tasks, arm avoidance, acquiring resources, and so forth. And here is our social mentalities. These are the social motivational systems. And they are the things that are really guiding you through life. And uh, what we know is that our emotions are, are in the service of motives. So our emotions serve our motives. Uh, and they are really changes of body state which allow us to um, take actions, right? But motives are always linked to, uh, sorry, emotions are always linked to to motives. And we have three types of mo of emotions, therefore, which are linked to the the thing. So, uh, which are linking to these basic motives. There's the issue of threat, so the anger, anxiety, all of those. They're all emotions which are in support of this one: harm avoidance, your protection system. And then drive emotions, positive rewards, feeling good about achieving things. They're linked to approach behavior. And then you have your rest and digest emotions, which are to do with contentment and chilling out and being at peace with yourself. And then the fourth, uh, sorry, the fourth function is linked to competencies. So birds need wings to fly, obviously, but they also need a brain that's going to move them around, make their wings smooth and so on and so on. But the reason that they're flying, the motive that they're flying, and the emotion they might have while they're flying, it does not impact the competencies to fly. So they could be flying to escape a predator or find food or whatever it is. Now, humans are, have particular advantages in cognitive competencies, particularly our abilities to reason, our abilities to mentalize, and also to be conscious of being conscious, which is called mindfulness. So these are uh, also extremely important. And then we have the behavioral systems. And we know that behavioral systems are important in their own right. These are output systems because you can change behavior. If you change behavior directly, you can change these other, other systems. For example, it doesn't matter how much you know about driving, uh, unless you actually get in and drive, uh, you're not going to get any better at it. Agoraphobia, for example, we know that the, probably the best therapies for agoraphobia are behavior exposure. It's the actual doing of exposing oneself and gradually feeling more confident in behavior change that can then change the person's motivation to go out. They can change their emotions when they go out. They can change how they think about what they what they think about going out. So the the ability to acquire behavioral skills through behavior change can actually change all of these. Okay. And of course, when it comes to 
these two, compassion versus competitiveness, you're going to find uh, the the threats when you're dealing with compassion are going to be different to the threats when you're engaging with competitiveness. And the emotions uh, when you're engaged in competitive behavior are going to be different to the emotions when you're engaged in caring behavior and so on and so on. So a little bit on this. This is all pretty straightforward to those of you who are in the evolutionary um, um, story. Uh, natural sex and sexual selection, they give rise to these mechanisms of uh, uh, algorithms, these algorithms, these modus and these algorithms. Here's another way of looking at that. Natural sexual selection, these are your psychological functions. Uh, and then they mature uh, according to attachment and your social niche. So the, what you're motivated to do, your disposition to certain kinds of emotions, how you reason to see the world, your beliefs. And the behaviors that you get to practice, and they're all linked to your basic structure, but also in terms of how you experience your life. You know, we, we know now that early life experiences can even affect epigenetics. They can change um, genetic sensitivities to different motives. They can have an impact on your threat system. For example, if you grow up in an abusive family, the epigenetic changes are such that your threat system becomes very sensitive. Um, your motivation for protection becomes highly uh, sensitized. This is another way of just showing the same thing, and I, I am rushing through this a little bit so I can get to the care system. Um, but the, these, it's really quite useful to think about these motivational systems as rooted in these algorithms, you see. So if there's a predator, then you stimulate. If it's food, then you have a different physiological system. If it's sexual behavior, then again, a different physiological system. If it's to do with threat, you know, in this situation, this is the subordinate. The subordinate has to show fear and reduce its behavior and hunker down and so forth. So these are quite important uh, basic um, systems which are biologically available to us. And for sure, they get uh, uh, sensitized and stimulated as we grow in life. But nevertheless, they are part of our biological um, inheritance. And of course, the one that we're interested in is this one. If infant is distressed, then we activate um, caring behavior. And we can think about what happens if any of those physiological systems uh, uh, get arise. So if an infant, for example, uh, is not cared for on a regular basis, then neglected or abused, those physiological, out the, out the physiology of the algorithms become disturbed. And we, we know that. Um, just a little bit on competitive behavior. Um, so competitive behavior, uh, again, requires there to be a, a specific social mentality, a way of processing social information, which allows individuals to work out are they likely to win or not win. Um, and we know, and again, John Price had, uh, had, had talked a lot about this, and uh, there's many um, specific physiological systems that are actually designed to enable a species, uh, individuals to compete with each other. Now, these are all males, but females compete as well, um, but in slightly different ways, not quite so aggressive, but they do certainly compete with each other and sub subordinate and suppress each other. This is uh, some primates. Uh, okay. Now, one of the interesting things is here is that Empathy and care for the other and concern with the suffering, the distress caused cannot evolve in this context. So in the context of competitive behavior, empathy and concern and guilt is not going to evolve. It can't evolve in this situation because in this situation, your basic interest is to frighten, scare, or possibly injure the other in order to subordinate them. So this is when the competitive system is going you will find that uh, individuals are much more vulnerable to callous behavior and so forth. And that's why you'll find that when you're looking at people who have narcissistic disorders and and uh, those sorts of things, they're more vulnerable to callousness because competitive psychology, that sense of entitlement and being superior and so forth, it literally turns off um, compassion and interest. And we know that psychopaths, for example, can show quite a lot of... Um, perspective taking that they're not too bad at that they can be very good at that but they had very little if any 
compassion interest. It's like it doesn't exist. They have very little interest in the well-being or the well welfare of others. So there we are. And of course, these are algorithms, you know, these two animals, they don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Fred, I don't know why I'm doing this. I hope I haven't given you a headache. It's okay. Now, humans love to think that they are way beyond all this automatic stuff and so forth and so on, and they certainly not going to be regulated by anything as as basic as innate algorithms. For goodness sake, no, we're humans. We're much better than that. Unfortunately, we're not. And as we've seen in some of the horrible things going on around the world, in uh, Ukraine and the Middle East and so on and so on, the algorithms remain very powerful generators of behavior. And once you get caught up in, say, a tribal algorithm or an algorithm of vengeance, you're in trouble. And one of the things that we're interested in is how do you turn off uh, some of the more destructive motivations that humans um, can get involved with? Because humans are potentially one of the most nasty, vicious, cruel species that have ever existed. And if you think about, you know, our wars, our holocaust, the, the terrible tortures just down the road, there's... Uh, Tower of London, I mean, it's just extraordinary what people were doing to each other and have done to each other and are still doing to each other. It's pretty awful. So we do know then that these algorithms uh, can be easily, relatively easily triggered and then uh, we're all in trouble unless we can learn how to control them. Um, okay, so I want to go on a little bit. Now, Let's talk a little bit about caring behavior because caring behavior is what we want to focus on really for the rest of the talk. Um, the key thing about social motivational systems is they have to co-evolve. They cannot evolve by themselves. For caring to evolve, there needs to be an evolution of a desire to care and behave with care, but there also needs to evolve a mind that is recipient to receiving care. Okay. Now we know in autism, for example, that the parent is orientated to be very caring, but the infant is not that orientated or the mind's not cued in uh, so well to receiving and responding to care, such as eye gaze and, and so on and so on. Um, so this is really quite important and that's the, that's the human version. So the, the key thing is caring evolves with this reciprocal interaction. Now, this is important because Actually, what we also know is that these reciprocal interacting, interacting systems, uh, uh, um, being a care provider, being able to be sensitive to distress, and being able to respond to it, also operate within one's own head. In other words, you can also be sensitive to your own distress and be able to care and take appropriate action for your own distress. You can be soothing of yourself, but equally... You can also be competitive with yourself. You can be very critical of yourself. You can put yourself down a lot, and then you end up feeling defeated and useless and inferior because of your own self-attacking system. Literally, you are, and we've got some um, fMRI studies showing that literally when you engage in harsh self-criticism, you're stimulating pretty much the same brain system as if somebody else was criticizing you. So these systems that are for caring and for competing and for hostility, they can be used interpersonally, but also intrapersonally as well. So it's very important that. So if we think about some of the evolution of caring behavior, actually there are many different avenues to caring behavior. It's, it's. Uh, let me just come out of here because I want to get on with this. Um, here are four avenues. Let me go through this a little bit more slowly. Um, one avenue is responding to injury and um, coming to the rescue and caring for individuals until they recover. And interestingly enough, this um, pathway is even observable in ants. Ants will carry their injured colleagues back to the nest if they've got if they've lost a leg or whatever, and their chances of recovery are much higher than if they're not. If they've lost too many legs, then I'm afraid they're just left to die. <laughs> It's not so good. But the issue of rescuing behavior is quite important. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, some individuals can be very orientated to rescuing behavior, but not necessarily other aspects of compassion. Then we have the attachment system, of course, where we form close relationship with our gene relatives and offspring. Uh, this is Bowlby's work. 
Uh, then we also have other processes that humans, when they went through a hunter-gatherer period about 2 million years ago, started on that. But um, because of changes to the birth canal, uh, the human birthing became quite a dangerous and, and risky process. In fact, we have the most painful, I say we, because I'm a man, I just done to be, uh, but our females are the most dangerous and painful births of all primates. And part of that linked, uh, generated um, caring by relatives. So in many hunter-gatherer societies, babies are born and the, they are um, handed around to the relatives and so on and so on. So caring moved out of just being purely focused in by the mother and became distributed by a group of relatives, um, older children sometimes, aunts and grandmothers and that sort of thing. And we became very much um, orientated towards being cared by communities, not just by individuals. And that's quite a big story, which we can talk about another time. And that also links into some of Robin Dunbar's brilliant work on how groups work and how they support each other and the egalitarian ways of living and so on and so on. The key thing really is this idea that uh, the key thing really is this idea that the evolution of caring behavior and compassion, that ability to be sensitive to suffering, it's not one thing. It's it's it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, this is the paper by Sharon Kessler on, and where she talks about all kinds of species that care for each other and how they re how they rescue each other and acts that they do, reciprocal acts of caring and so forth. Absolutely fascinating. And then this uh, Penny Speakin's work on how early humans were surviving with clearly seriously injured and had illnesses and they could not possibly have survived unless they were cared for and provisioned uh, in their journey to getting well. Very important. Then we know that in terms of the attachment system, this was a slow moving process. It starts off with protection. Okay, that's the first stage that there is some protection given to the infant. So this <laughs> crocodile, <laughs> carries her hatchling to the water that protects it from um, predation. Uh, but after that, it doesn't do anything. She doesn't feed it. She doesn't pay its mortgage or help it through university or anything like that. It's just that one act of, of protection. But by the time we get to mammals, lots of other things are happening now to facilitate the growth of the infant into a rep uh, reproducing survival uh, uh, replication of the gen genetic replication of the species um, uh, and this is where you get into provisioning and then provisioning becomes very very important for mammals and this creates a whole, whole range of affiliative and supportive behaviors and we can see here then that the mother particularly primate mothers and particularly human mothers now caring motivation is becoming really quite complicated it's to do with paying attention it's protecting, feeding, temperature regulation. You know, a whole lot of stuff is going on now in caring because the infant is becoming more recipient to caring. And it also means that a lot of the processes of the infant can develop post-birth. If you're a turtle, uh, your brain has to be pretty much ready to go, go it alone from the day you hatch. Whereas for primates and particularly humans, and they can learn, they can develop, or they can evolve brains, which are going to learn uh, a lot of stuff that they're going to need. Um, so they don't have to have all of this automatic stuff going on. Um, so there we are. We that You can see how we can get into our um, algorithm for compassion, sensitivity to the needs of our infant, blah, blah, blah. We can do all of that. And then we have John Bowlby, of course, who talks a lot about the psychological functions of caring. I'm not going to go too much into this because this is a um, thing by its, itself. But what um, Bowlby highlighted was that uh, the in, in humans in particular, well, actually in primates and other mammalian species, the infant is evolved to stay in some proximity to the parent because the parent is the provider of protection and of resources. Remember, protection and resources, those two things, two motivational systems, very, very important. And the parent provides that in the first instance. So a secure base offers a source of security and guidance 
to go out and explore and develop confidence, whereas a safe haven is a as a way of emotional regulation. So the infant goes out and gets a little bit lost or whatever, then um, uh, sorry, if the infant goes out and gets lost or gets distressed, the parent will be able to find the infant and also calm the infant down. So in a way, secure base is stimulating the infant to go out and explore and develop and grow, whereas safe haven is the ability to calm the infant and regulate distress. These are two fundamental uh, processes of, of, of attachment and of caring behavior. So there we are. And also the sharing of positive emotion uh, is extremely important because the sharing of positive emotion is part of what creates a secure base because it stimulates the, the babies and then the infant's explorative behavior to, to take joy in exploring the other, to take joy in exploring the world, knowing that the parent is, is there, but also the parent is a source of that joy. And we also know that play is extremely important. So we can go into understanding now. So we've looked at the evolution of caring behavior. We can see the caring behavior had these two qualities to it. Um, and now we can look at these qualities and we can begin to see how by stimulating, working with these qualities, we're beginning to see how we can build a, a therapy. So a secure base then, the caring that's provided in the secure base it, it, it encourages the infant to explore and develop their wisdoms. It's a validating, it provides mentalization, emotion regulation skills, and the ability to be playful and take joy out of life. Now, of course, we know that if children are neglected or abused, these systems, this interactional process starts to break down. Okay, so rather than taking risks, the infant and the child becomes more sensitive to threat. The parent can be the threat, not the encouragement. Um, the parent may not validate or mentalize the infant. The, the infant may not learn emotion regulation skills. The infant may not, particularly neglected children, have a lot of trouble with uh, experiencing spontaneous joy and playfulness. And when these children become depressed, they have a real flatness about them. They can be really quite tricky to stimulate, to actually engage the world and find things that are pleasant for them. And then, of course, you have the secure, uh, safe haven functions, which are the soothing functions and so on. And so on. And once again, these are things that I think all of us as therapists will be doing to some degree or other. But when, but when you're doing them, it's important to see that you are in the care system. That's what you're in. Okay, and as part of the care system, not only are you providing what the infant needs to grow and develop, but the infant has to be able to respond to that. Same with your client. Not only are you providing what the client needs in order to explore their own minds or develop or take on their trauma memories or whatever it is, but the, the, the client has to be able to have the internal capacities to be able to use what you are providing so there's that again. That's just that uh, definition again. I won't worry too much about that. Now, the other thing that's important then is to highlight this. I'm only going to go on for another few minutes. Highlight this process because these motivational systems evolved with very clear physiological infrastructures. So the evolution of attachment and affiliative behavior uh, created a range of detectors which enabled you to detect individuals who are safe, individuals who are helpful, um, and so forth. And these are linked to hormones such as oxytocin. There's the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve over here is very, very important for how we detect suffering, how we respond to suffering. The frontal cortex, again, many aspects of the orbital and uh, and so on, frontal cortex, dorsal lateral frontal cortex, very, very important for our ability to um be able to be sensitive to the signals of, of suffering and to respond to them. Uh, people who have problems with the frontal cortex, you remember Finnegas Gage, for example, that got the bar through the frontal lobes. And one of the things that he lost was sensitivity to others um, and certainly didn't have much in the way of compassion. Um, so we do know that they are quite important fundamental pathways that are really quite important for our caring systems and our compassion systems. So compassion 
um, training then is seeking to stimulate these systems. And we know now that we can develop therapies that can go after oxytocin. That we have specific therapies that can develop the vagus. There are breathing exercises, postural exercises, imagery exercises that can stimulate the vagus. Just like we can stimulate your sexual system by giving you sexual fantasies, and that will change your blood flow in your body, won't it? And release hormones from your pituitary. We can also give people uh, images and practices that will stimulate these different brain systems. And we want to do that because for people who these systems haven't matured so well because of abuse or whatever, they need to get these systems working. And so that's what we do. Now, the other thing is to mention to you is that although we can identify the physiology of the mammalian system, humans have this fantastic cognitive competencies that I mentioned at the beginning, this knowing awareness, and that is really what gives rise to compassion. So compassion is not just caring behavior. Caring behavior is fundamental, of course, but you have to have this other component to it. So, you know, rats will care for their infants, uh, for their infant pumps. Uh, many species will care for their for others, but that's not compassion. Compassion is when we use this uh, new brain to direct our motivation. Okay. So, and the other thing about it is you need science. So um, you need consciousness. It's to do with the experience of suffering. Compassion is about the experience of suffering. So for example, if you, you know, if you're, if you like growing your tomatoes and then one day your tomatoes are blown over or, or destroyed in the storm, you will be very unhappy about that maybe because you love your tomatoes, but you won't be compassionate to your tomatoes. You won't say, oh, poor tomatoes, how much you suffer? Because you know they're not conscious. It's only conscious suffering that compassion relates to. You might care for your, you might try and resurrect your tomatoes and care for them, but you can't, you won't have compassion for them because compassion is rooted to this awareness of suffering. So that's another fundamental difference. So there we are. Compassion is when we use our new brain competency to purposely and perfectly and wisely identify suffering. So this is, um, this is quite key to compassion. Otherwise people confuse compassion with just straightforward caring. Okay, then I'm going to go into this. You can so I'll send you the slides around. You can see this a little later. Um, so one other thing, just to sort of begin to wrap up now, is to understand that compassion is not a benzo. It, this is a great study because it highlights the fact that people often think compassion is about soothing or being kind or whatever it is, but not really. Um, what this uh, the, the the Roman the 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 Italian um, colleagues have shown is that when we are sensitive to suffering, uh, different parts of our brain are lighting up than when we are actually planning on helpful um, actions. And this is important because we can see here that you know the the compassion of a firefighter might be very different to say somebody fighting injustice and different to um, uh, being sensitive and uh, empathic. So again, we've got to be careful that because we have these different uh, trajectories of compassion, remember rescuing behavior, some people are very attracted to rescuing behavior. They will lay down their lives for you, but they're not necessarily going to make the best parents or the most empathic lovers or partners, whereas people can be fantastic lovers and partners, very empathic, very gentle, very kind, but they're not necessarily going to make the best freedom, um, you know, firefighters or human activists or whatever. So we have to be aware then that compassion can have very different textures according to the context. People can be have different types of compassion. And in therapy, you may need different types of compassion for your, your client. They may need different skills. Sometimes they need the ability to be empathic to themselves. Sometimes, as with mentalizing therapies, Peter Fonagay and Alan Bateman and Patrick's work um, talks about how some people are not very empathic to others. Sometimes they're not very empathic to themselves, right? Some people are quite empathic, but they're not assertive. They're very socially anxious or whatever. So compassion is the ability to develop the courage and the wisdom, right? That's the key thing, to bring that... Uh, 
awareness to this is what I want to work on. And you, you bring that awareness, not by forcing yourself or arguing with yourself or criticizing yourself or whatever, but actually a very gentle, encouraging, supportive, like a good parent does with a child. It's okay. You can do this way. Just go step at a time, blah, 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 blah. So using that vagal frontal cortical system all the time to be able to engage with um, whatever threat the client is trying to sort out. And we talk a lot about brain states, so I'm just going to finish off now to think about CFT and the brain state approach. Now, what all, all a brain state approach really means is that at any point in time, your brain is uh, represents a state of complex interactions between the cells and what's going on in your body or the firing of your trillions of neurons. And all of these different components of mind are operating simultaneously. So as I say, you know, notice how a brain state, such as a threat brain state, is associated with attention, with thinking, with emotions, with motives. That's what a brain state is, right? It's, the, it's, it's a pattern of interactions. And we also know that these systems interact with each other. So if you are focusing on threat, you're highly attentive to threat, that's going to have an impact on your body and your brain. That's going to impact on your emotions and on your thinking. If, on the other hand, you switch your attention, you learn to refocus your attention, then the whole system can change. Or it could be your thinking and your imagination, or it could be things happening within your body. You know, we know that, you know, when people get exhausted or sometimes um, women uh, uh, in their menstrual cycles and so forth are getting physiological changes that are having quite um, uh, a major impacts on these other physiological, si on these other systems as well. So in CFT, you're always thinking about these multiple interacting processes and you're trying to develop therapies that will have some kind of impact on all of them, not just cognition, not just the body, not just behavior, but you're thinking about how they interact together and you're looking at how they interact together. So again, if you have a happy state, you can see all of these things will change, right? If you have a compassionate brain state, then all of these things will change. If you have a self-critical brain state, here you are again. This will affect the pattern of these interactions. And of course, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to create compassionate brain states because compassionate brain states will counteract these states. Compassionate brain states will counteract threat states. And so this is one way in which you can think about this is that when we create compassionate brain states, and remember, compassion has an evolutionary trajectory. It's a basic motivational system. We understand some of the physiological mechanisms that are, that are part of compassion. We know that the caring system is partly evolved as a regulation for threat for the infant, but also um, for human, for all of us, really, that, you know, when we feel supported and connected to other people, our threat systems are tending to tone down. So when you have compassionate mind states, both within individuals and between individuals, this has a, a, a physiological, psychological, and social way of settling this system. Whereas individuals who are prone to this, they find compassionate mind states difficult. They may not be living in uh, relationships that are particularly compassionate to them. They might be living in critical relationships or they're very lonely or, or they may have a very critical relationship with themselves. They don't have a particularly compassionate mind state to themselves. And therefore, they can't use this brain state to help settle their threat state. So that's what you're trying to do. So there we are. I've gone a little bit over my time. I do apologize. But this is the basic of uh, the basis of evolution is to create biological forms that are orientated to survive and reproduce. That's what DNA does. DNA is simply a factory. It's a factory for creating biological forms. And of course, there have been trillions of different biological forms. 99% uh, of all biological forms that don't exist anymore. They've gone out of existence. They didn't make it. So this genetic unfolding pattern is what it's doing. Now, in order for it to do that, uh, this gives rise to life tasks. And these are three basic life tasks that all living things are confronted with to protect, to detect and protect from harms to the self, 
the le- uh, trees will curl their leaves so they haven't got enough water or they send their roots down uh, more lower. Some uh, plant species develop saps that are poisonous to their uh, um, insects that would infect them and so on and so on. Um, acquiring resources, again, very, very important. The drive to achieve and do and so on and so on. And that takes you often into the competitive not always competitive, it can be competitive. And then you have the need to be able to rest and digest. And these are underpinned by genetic and physiological mechanisms. And we know that epigenetics are important here, that some individuals can be highly um, sensitized to protection or sensitized to the need to acquire resources, to need to have power, to need to have control as a result of early life experiences. We know also that some individuals find it very difficult to feel safe. Traumatized people can often have a lot of problems with the rest and digest system and that sense of being able just to settle, to feel at peace with oneself and to feel supported and connected. They have a lot of trouble with that because that system hasn't been terribly well um, developed. Okay, so the life tasks, as we said, give rise to the full functions of mind and these, as a therapist, are what you're interested in. You're interested in all of these. So for us, as CFT therapists, how do we stimulate compassion motivation? How do we help people realize that compassion motivation is going to be the thing that gives them courage and wisdom? Because remember the attachment system, remember secure base, that's what it does, right? Uh, and the physiological mechanisms that will support courage and wisdom and the ability to tolerate threat. How are we going to help people develop and work with compassionate emotions or work compassionately with difficult emotions to learn how to tolerate difficult emotions, learn how to accept different emotions, learn how not to fight or be experiential avoidant with different emotions, learn how to integrate difficult emotions and process difficult emotions. How are we going to help people develop compassionate ways of thinking rather than vengeful ways of thinking or um, self-sabotaging ways of thinking or self-critical ways of thinking? And how are we going to help people engage in compassionate behaviors? In CFT, there's quite a lot that we do for compassionate behavior training. Uh, And again, that's uh, maybe another talk. Motives give rise to brain states, which help for the flourishing or the mental health problems. And as I said, receiving compassion, particularly when young, seems to be vital for facilitating individuals to be able to be compassionate to themselves and to form compassionate relationships with others. And that is a basis for well-being and flourishing. So compassion focused therapy seeks to cultivate the care system and the compassion system. Remember, compassion is when we use our new brain to be able to purposely pursue compassion in order to create these states of mind, these brain states, which are conducive to well-being, which are supportive of internal secure base and safe haven. So there we are. Uh, We have a diploma in compassion-focused therapy. If you want to um, um, do that, we've just had a meta-analysis, a big meta-analysis that's shown it's very effective. And we've got a a conference (laughs) in um, Birmingham. Anyway, enough of me. I shall uh, now hand back to... um, my colleagues, Adam and Riyadh, and thank you so much. I've got a little bit over my time. I do apologize, but I'll make these uh, all these um, slides available as a PDF for you. Um, Lovely. That on. was that was fantastic, uh, Paul. Excellent uh, presentation. Can I can I uh, just let the audience know that you can actually put uh, voice questions to Paul. It, they don't have to. You don't have to be. Um, uh, the questions don't have to be in the chat box, so we can um, unmute you, and um, you can uh, you can put some you can put some um, voice questions. So yeah, we have one hand up, uh, and that is by Kurtu Magenda. Uh, mm-hmm. Unmute yourself, no, Kurtu. Yeah. I am. And, um, put your and uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think there was indeed in the chat box a couple of previous questions but you can take them on i guess as well yeah yeah uh we'll we'll do them but let's take your voice question 
Okay. Okay. So I was wondering, uh, how, as a therapist, do you see this in your practical work or, or in your studies that, um, uh, it's become almost like a cliche that the modern Western lifestyle is very in like, uh, it has emphasis on individuality and like competition. And, um, and do you think that this is something that you could compare to other cultures or other places? Like how does this affect with the mental issues that people have perhaps like in, in this culture, do you think there's a difference? Oh, be... It's a wonderful question. Yes, um, culture and context have a very major impact. Uh, we've seen um, increasing problems in our younger generation, partly linked to things like social media and, and competitiveness and so on. And in cultures that are less competitive and more collective, it's not that they 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 have less um, issues with mental health. Not that they don't have any. They're not saying that at the moment. But we know that the more unequal a society is, and there's the equality trust. You can go and look at this on um, Richard Wilkinson's work and so on and so on. Um, then the more crime you get, the more mental health problems you get and so on. So the more equal a society, the more a society feels connected and supported, um, the lower the levels of mental health. Um, we know, for example, that with the destruction of the health service by our right-wing government, um, people are just really anxious about getting sick and getting old. And I mean, the anxiety is as a result that we no longer have a society that we, we trust. We, we are a generation that are living now where our children perceive the world is getting worse. Whereas when I grew up, you know, in the fifties and sixties, um, we thought it was going to be great. We scared, everything was getting better, but now that's not what people are seeing. They're seeing, you know, climate change and and so on and so on. So I think it's a brilliant point that you make. Culture has a huge impact by overstimulating aggressiveness and selfishness. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question and um, for your answer, Paul. There, there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat box. Um, the first question I'm not sure I understand, and it's about bodybuilders. Um, Andrew, if you're still there, uh, do you want to put your question as a voice question? If not, I'm going to skip it. <laughs> well, very quickly, it's a great question because oxytocin is a tricky one, actually, because oxytocin can increase uh, pro-social behavior within group, but also it can increase aggressiveness to out-group members. So oxytocin is really quite a a, a tricky hormone actually it's not just a love dove hormone it's a it was a little bit a little bit tricky and again i think with the issue of steroid abuse and the interactions with hostile behavior and so forth so so it's it's a great question but it's it's beyond my ability to answer it for you i'm afraid okay and uh, i think andrew is on um on a train so he's not able to put the um question as a voice question so the next one is by catherine and uh, her question is that in clinical settings, we often deal with female patients needing advice on clari on clarifying to male friends that their compassionate actions stem from genuine care, not romantic interest. They seek ways to prevent misunderstandings when direct communication is ineffective due to suspicion or refusal to engage in face-to-face dialogue what is your advice in such situations yes i think it's a great question isn't it? i mean one of the most important issues within caring behaviors is social trust and so when individuals are really not quite sure what the signals that they are receiving is this a, are you you know you you appear to be caring for me are you generally caring for me or is it manipulative because you want me to get you want me in bed tonight or something like that so social trust and the ability to uh, trust the signals of w within interactions is a very, very important um, question. And particularly for people who have maybe had re relationships that they should have been able to trust, but they weren't. Well, for example, maybe abused in various ways as children. That can be very, very difficult. And they may really struggle in identifying what is genuine and what is not genuine. Sometimes they can be trusting when they shouldn't be and sometimes they're 
mistrusting when they shouldn't be. So it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. It's difficult. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul, I wonder from the practical point of view within the NHS, can you tell us uh, how widespread is um, C CFT available nowadays? Are there therapists who are trained uh, CFT therapists in the NHS and do they, um, is it as widely available as CBT or, I mean, I've been out of practice now for a few years, so can you update us on uh, on that? Well, it's a great question, Riyad, because um, it, a lot of CBT, CBT now is a very broad school, very, you know, it's, um, I mean, it still sees itself as a, as a one thing, but it's not really. I mean, you have, well, it is, I mean, but you have attachment theorists and you have you know, emotion-based theorists and so on, and you have chair work, all kinds of things. It's a, it's a hugely complicated. Um, so a lot of CBT therapists are using uh, compassion-focused therapy interventions as well. They wouldn't necessarily call themselves CFT therapists. We The other point is that you're not going to get much of a rollout until NICE picks up on the meta-analysis. And as I say, we've just got this bigger meta-analysis that have come out. So we are hoping that in the next four or five years, then CEFT, because the data is very strong now. I mean, it's not a magic by any means uh, at all, but it holds up very well compared to other therapies and often is slightly better. So we're hoping that over the next few years, um, there will be more recommendations because a lot of therapists run into trouble with their managers because they say, we only want evidence-based therapies. What's the evidence for CFT, blah, 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 which in one sense is fair enough. Uh, so at the moment, it's it's it patchy. It's very patchy where CFT where you can get uh, a CFT. There there are places that will that do do it. There are trusts that do do it, but it is patchy. Is it diagnosis uh, based, or is it um, more of um, a, um, a a kind of personality or approach based? I mean, what. Where does CFT, uh, or what kind of conditions would you say CFT would be uh, the preferred um, uh, uh, psychotherapy of choice? Well, I think it's a great question because we call it compassion-focused therapy, not compassion therapy, right? No, no, of that's, course, no. Yeah, that's important because what it means is that you're it just it's, whatever intervention you're doing, you're trying to make sure that the individual is utilizing these compassion-based systems. They're not trying to force themselves or be, you know, aggressive with themselves or criticizing themselves when they fail and that sort of thing. So we know, for example, like with acrophobia, um, exposure in behavior therapy is very important, but it is a compassionate way of doing that. We know chair work, which comes out of gestalt therapy, can be extremely be be beneficial to people. So many of the techniques that we can use in CFT, you'll find in many other therapies is stuff in ACT, you know, ACT and DBT, all these things. <clears throat> but what we're suggesting is that given that there is this, these fundamental systems, <clears throat> if we can texture our therapy within a, a compassion texture, this actually increases their efficacy. So would you say the applications of CFT are similar yep. to the uh, to CBT in terms of scope and conditions and yep, so forth? very much so. I mean, people are um, adapting them all the time. You know, we have colleagues that are working with CFT with people on the, with learning difficulties and so forth. You, you know, obviously you're adapting your therapy for the person that you're working with, but the basic idea is how to help. Um, and, you know, attachment theory has been very, very important to CFT. We do a lot with attachment there, how you create a secure base with your client, how they begin to experience into some degree of interpersonal trust with you, how you are able to encourage them to explore things that maybe they're not so keen to explore, how you're able to help them to be feel grounded and emotional regulation. What the, our argument is that all of these things are very important, but they, they will uh, work better for you when you have some awareness of the 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 motivational system to make sure you're staying in the care motivation system and you're not slipping out into uh, more of a competitive or a forcing or a critical uh, system we have another question in the chat box 
uh, by Catherine, uh, other common scenarios often revolve around individuals lacking compassion, spreading rumors, falsehoods to harm even innocent people. How can we inspire empathy in individuals in such a state of mind, encouraging them to refrain from causing harm and instead resolving issues by directly communicating with those involved? Yes, I mean, I think that is, I think you put your finger on saying that's so important. You you have recognized that this lack of compassion is really a problem, even for people who have empathy, right? Remember, empathy is a competency. It's not a motive. <clears throat> so you can be vengeful. If you want to be vengeful and you're empathic, you'll know how to hurt somebody. You know how to get back. You know how to plan your vengeance and so forth. If you want to manipulate people, you're going to be much better if you're empathic than if you're not. Okay, so empathy is a way of understanding the minds of others and tuning into the minds of others. It's not necessarily done with a compassionate or caring motivation. So that's really, really important. So the question you're asking is, how do we stimulate people to use their competencies, their reasoning, their intelligence, their capacity for mindfulness and for empathy in the service of preventing suffering, of addressing suffering, preventing it rather than causing it? That's hugely important. And one of the problems that we have in the world, we've always had in the world, is that we live in society partly to do with agriculture and group size, but uh, many leaders uh, lack a compassion motivation, but they're very power orientated and they do terrible damage. Um, so if you, you know, I won't name names at the moment, but there are many leaders in the world right now who may well be empathic to a degree, but they have very little compassion motivation, very little sensitivity, no guilt. Remember, guilt is part of the carry system. They don't have any guilt at all. They're as callous as they come. They don't care how much suffering they cause, provided they can do what they want to do. Um, so this is a huge issue, and I think it's a big research issue. My PhD student is looking at how do we change um, compassion training for people with narcissism. Uh, it's it's a massive question, massive question, because it's, it's the ones who do not have compassion motivation but are power-orientated. They are the ones that are basically screwing the world, I'm afraid. Well, I know that Paul uh, wants to be away by quarter past, and uh, we're almost there. So I'd like to thank um, Professor Paul Gilbert uh, for a great lecture. Uh, and uh, please tell your friends about about the um, uh, this talk, which is going to be on YouTube. Uh, they can watch it, um, and I'm sure it's going to be a great resource for teaching uh, and uh, training on uh, CFT. And there's loads of thank yous on uh, in the chat Thank box, you very much. Uh, Paul. And thanks again, and um, thanks for your support of our. Um, evolutionary section and also of the evolutionary uh, group at the Royal College. Yeah, no, it's it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. You do fantastic, Red. And do remember that compassion is probably the most courageous and wisest of all our motives, because it is the one thing that motivates us to to not cause suffering, to try where we can to prevent it. That motivation is 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 the as I say the most courageous and the wisest. And, and, and the most human as well. And the most, and the most human. That's right. You're quite right because you have this ability. So it's not just about being a bit kind or a bit this or that. It's it's really fundamental to us to to our future. I think. Thank you so much. Well, thanks again, and thanks for everyone who's attended. Okay. Bye -bye. Good evening, everyone.